John Support once noted in about a John Munn's favorite themes for a Dharma talk. One was customs of the noble ones, and the other was practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. Because the customs of the noble ones are customs that go against the customs of practically every nation on earth. They put the Dharma first, they put the training of the mind first. And very closely connected to the customs of the noble ones is that principle of practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, one, instead of trying to change the Dharma to fit you, you're trying to change yourself to fit the Dharma. And then two, as it's defined in the canon, it means practicing for the sake of dispassion. And again, this goes against every custom, every culture in the world, which is all aimed at passion. There's a story in the canon where some monks are going to a foreign country, and after paying their respects to the Buddha, they go to say goodbye to Sariputta. And he asks them, when someone in that country asks you, what does your teacher teach? What are you going to tell them? And the monks say, well, we'd like to hear what you'd say. And so Sariputta said his first answer would be that the, his teacher teaches dispassion. Then as he went on to say, Intelligent people then ask dispassion for what? But most people in the world nowadays wouldn't even bother to ask. They hear the word dispassion, they're running the other way. Their society has trained them to think that their passions are good, their likes and dislikes are important. Because you can get work out of people that way, you can get money out of people that way. And here's the Buddha teaching something that goes directly opposed to that. Which means that when you're practicing the Dharma, you have to learn how to step aside and sit, stand aside from your culture. It means you have to be a self-starter. There's a lot of talk about not self in Buddhism, but to practice you need a very strong sense of your values. How are you going to train your mind in having the ability to maintain yourself in your original intention that this is what you want to do. Because after all, if you can't depend on yourself, if you make up your mind to do one thing and then end up doing something else just because you felt like it, you can't trust yourself. And when you can't trust yourself, you're not going to find anyone in the world you can trust. So you have to sit yourself down and tell yourself, this is what I really want. I see that I'm causing myself unnecessary suffering and I want to put an end to it. And whatever is in line with that, you've got to say, I'm going to start side with that, whether it comes from inside or outside. As the Buddha said, one of the measures of your discernment, particularly with regard to effort, is seen with regard to four kinds of actions. So the actions that you like to do that you know are going to give good results. And the actions you don't like to do, you know, are going to get bad results. Those, he said, are basically no-brainers. Doesn't require much effort or thought. Things you like to do give good results, you do them. Things you don't like to do give bad results, you don't do them. It's the things that you'd like to do but give bad results, and things you don't like to do but give good results. That's where the rubber hits the road. You, know, you have to figure out, how do I talk myself? into doing the things that I don't like doing but will be good in the long run? And how do I talk myself out of doing the things I'd like to do but are going to be bad in the long run? The book gives many examples of how you can think to get yourself around. One is, of course, to think about the principle of heedfulness. This is where that sense of self comes in. You realize that you are going to be on the receiving end of your actions. And what kind of actions would you like to be on the receiving end of? Your actions are going to make all the difference in how you experience the world, the person you become, the world you experience. So you better be careful about what you do and say and think. As the Buddha said, this principle of heedfulness is what underlies all skillful activity, all skillful qualities in the mind. And then based on that, you can develop other qualities too. 
One is compassion for yourself, compassion for people around you. Realizing that if you really love yourself, you're not going to let yourself do unskillful things, no matter how much you like them. And if you're doing something that's skillful and suddenly you decide you don't like it anymore, you've got to figure out how I'm going to feel after having left that behind. If you really have compassion yourself, you're not going to let it go. Because if you let it go, then either you just simply suffer the results or you put yourself into denial, saying, well, it wasn't all that good anyhow, which cuts you off from developing a path you can really depend on. Another quality that again goes with a strong sense of self is, one, on the one hand, a sense of pride, healthy pride. That you're a human being, other people have done this, they're human beings too. Why can't you do it too? And as you start developing skills, you take the craftsman's pride in his skills. You don't want anything shoddy to come out in your thoughts or your words or your deeds. Coupled with this is a sense of shame. Not the shame that's the opposite of pride, but the shame that's the opposite of shamelessness. In other words, you look at your actions and when you're frank with yourself, say, these things are beneath me. And that right there raises your quality as a person. So you don't want to stoop to anything that is beneath you. And then there's having a good sense of humor, learning how to laugh at your foibles, laugh at your greed, laugh at your aversion, laugh at your delusion. See how foolish they are. In the canon, most of the humor is in the Vinaya, which is the section on disciplinary rules. You wouldn't think with discipline that there would be a lot of humor, but this is how they make it palatable. Stories about the monk who gets so drunk, as in, in the Buddhist words, back when he was sober he could do battle with a fire-breathing naga, but now that he's drunk he couldn't even do battle with a salamander. And by pointing out the humor of a lot of people's weaknesses and misbehavior, it puts you on the side of not wanting to be weak and not wanting to misbehave. So when lust comes up, learn how to laugh at it. When greed comes up, learn how to laugh at it. When laziness comes up, the Buddha has a nice passage where he talks about the things that people talk about to excuse their laziness, and they're precisely the things that other people would use to make themselves put out more effort. For example, you're, you've been sick and you're recovering a little bit, and you, if you're lazy, you say, well, I'm not quite well yet, I better let rest some more. But the person who's beginning to recover says, here's my opportunity, the illness could get worse, I better practice now. If you've eaten too much, you can make that an excuse for laziness. Or if you've eaten too little, you can make that an excuse for laziness. I mean, everything becomes an excuse for laziness. If you learn how to laugh at it, that takes some of the, the power of that defilement away. But in every case, it requires having a good, strong sense of self, a healthy sense of self. We have so many different selves inside, and you have to ask yourself, which ones you're going to side with? The ones that are self-destructive? The ones that say, well, I just don't feel like it right now, without giving any good reason. And why do you want to nurture those and feed those senses of self inside? You've got some, so many better ones inside that you could nurture and feed. It's like you have a whole stable. You feed the, you feed the horses that are going to help you with the work. And the ones that fight back, you let them go. Because then, after all, it is your well-being that we're talking about here. We practice not for anybody's sake, as John Fuyung used to say. Nobody hired us to practice. We're doing this of our own free will. Nobody's forcing us to practice. We should be in charge. So the question, of course, is who are you going to put in charge inside? 
when the Buddha talks about the faculties of conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. That word faculty basically means who's in charge in the mind. And so you do your best to put someone good in charge and make them powerful so they can keep control over everything inside. And that's how you, your practice develops and how you can maintain it, and how you become your own refuge. We talk about taking the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha as our refuge. What that means is we take their qualities and we try to realize them inside, their potentials there within us. Qualities of comp compassion, discernment, purity. They're there in potential form. And the Buddha shows that if you develop those potentials, they can take you far. And so you take his example, you take the Dharma, you take the Sangha as, as an example, and try to bring those qualities into being in you. And you find that you have a refuge that you can depend on inside. As for the world outside, it's not all that dependable. But what matters is what you've got inside yourself.